Hi, welcome to Al-Muqaddima. My name is Siavish. Paper is, without a doubt, one of the most important inventions ever made because of its contribution to the storage and transmission of knowledge. Besides the printing press, arguably nothing did more to make the storage and transmission of knowledge more effortless and cheaper than paper, making information more accessible to more people. Today, even though the usage of paper for writing is in decline, it is still so ever-present in our everyday life, from wallpaper to packaging, that we take it for granted and think of it as essentially something as common and unexceptional as the dirt beneath our feet. However, its story, like that of the dirt beneath our feet, is anything but unexceptional. It has had a long journey from its inception in China to its improvement and transmission by Muslims and finally new ways to produce it using some serious new advancements in the field of chemistry by Europeans. Today we'll focus on that middle part of its story, the arrival of paper in the Middle East from China, advancements made by the Muslims and finally the transmission of paper and paper making to Europe from the Islamic world. This video is brought to you by, well, you guys. Thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel and making these videos possible. Al Muqaddimah is funded only by Patreon and as you can see, the videos take a long time to research, edit and produce. And it's only because of my patrons that I am able to put this kind of time into these videos and keep them free from any kind of paywall. So if you want to pledge a dollar or more to support the channel, you can head over to my Patreon. Link is in the description. You can also become a member right here on YouTube. There's some cool stuff that comes with it. Back to the video. Before paper, the vast majority of writing surfaces in Europe and the Middle East were papyrus and parchment. Papyrus is made from the papyrus plant, which grew abundantly in the marshy regions of the Nile Delta. Only in the right conditions did the stems of the papyrus plant grow thick enough to be usable for writing. The Nile Delta had those right conditions, so the ancient Egyptians essentially developed a monopoly on manufacturing papyrus, the writing material. They manufactured it and exported it to many places, including parts of Europe. Now, papyrus isn't very durable. It can be damaged by folding and it needs low humidity to survive for long. So, while it's a good material for the Middle East's hot and dry climate, it's not very good for Europe. Over the centuries, another material known as parchment was developed. While parchment gets its name from the city of Pergamon in western Anatolia, it was actually likely developed in the Middle East. Since parchment is made from animal skin, it can be produced anywhere, and it can survive in higher humidity than papyrus can, so it was better for European consumption. However, it was more expensive, since you'd have to kill an animal to get the skin. The skin of younger animals in general made better quality parchment, but it was even more expensive because killing a young animal costs you the future exploitation and usage of the animal. Till the 11th century, both papyrus and parchment were used in Europe. In Egypt, papyrus seems to have been used for the majority of the documents written as well. Maybe some other parts of the Islamic world used it too because we know that Abbasid Caliph Al-Mu'tasim established a papyrus mill in his new capital of Samara, which was meant to replace Baghdad as the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. We also know that in the 10th century, when Sicily was under Muslim rule, the papyrus plant was grown there too. However, around the turn of the millennium, a new writing material had taken over and the long-established industry of manufacturing papyrus was dead after having prospered for some 4,000 years. This came to such an extent that even the native papyrus plant died out in Egypt by the 19th century. It had to be repopulated from the botanical gardens of Paris in 1872. This new material, paper, was invented over a thousand years earlier on the other side of the world, in China. Paper was invented in China, probably around the 2nd century BCE. Over the next eight centuries, they made changes to both paper and papermaking. 
While the earliest paper was made from hemp plants, over time the Chinese began using a number of plants for producing different types of paper for more specialized uses. By the time of the rise of Islam in the 630s, they had colored paper, waxed paper for a glossy surface, tissue paper, and yeah, toilet paper. A 9th century Arab traveler to China shows his disgust at the fact that the Chinese only used toilet paper. I relate, Arab traveler, I relate. The usage of toilet paper suggests that at least some form of paper was cheap enough to be used for that purpose. Sticking to the Marxist view of history, paper was also divided by class. The upper class used paper made from bark, among other materials, while the lower classes used paper made from grass, since grass was available everywhere. Paper even had military uses, where kites were used for signaling troops. One fascinating but likely fictional story mentions a general who flew a kite over a castle under siege to measure how long a tunnel would need to be for his troops to attack the besieging army from behind. But probably the most important usage of paper was for printing text. The Chinese invented a type of printing known as block printing. Basically, the text was carved out of a wood block, which was then painted with ink and pressed onto paper. I know, I'm oversimplifying, but this isn't a science channel. The Chinese even invented movable type printing press, but it didn't catch on because the Chinese language had such a large number of symbols that it was just easier to make a wood block of the whole text than it was to find and arrange the symbols. Again, oversimplifying. The earliest Muslims were, of course, Arabs. Arabs didn't have much of a writing tradition, and they prided themselves over their oral poetic tradition. However, Islam changed that. The Qur'an is considered the verbatim word of God by Muslims, and so it was necessary to record it as it was. Muslims memorized the Qur'an by heart, but Islamic tradition tells us that it was also written on all kinds of surfaces, from leaves to stone and leather. Parts of it were recorded in written form during the Prophet's lifetime. However, when the Muslims broke out of Arabia and conquered much of the Middle East, including Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Egypt, they were faced with the problem of managing this vast empire. For the purpose of tax collection and paying the military, Muslims began keeping records which were called daftar. The word daftar comes from the Greek word diftera, meaning leather or skin. In Persian and my mother language, Urdu, it means office, which is something that I find fascinating as it went from meaning leather to meaning office. Ironically, however, Muslims didn't use leather for keeping records. Instead, they relied on papyrus from the newly conquered province of Egypt. A side note here, the two early caliphates, the Umayyads and the Abbasids, are often seen in contrast to each other, not unlike the Greek Byzantines and the Persian Sassanid empires. The Umayyads are seen as more Byzantine-leaning and the Abbasids are seen as more Sassanid-leaning. Even in their usage of writing material before paper, they fit those leanings. The Umayyads used papyrus from Egypt like the Byzantine Empire had, and the early Abbasids, before paper, used parchment like the Sassanids had. However, this wouldn't continue for too long because there was a new material coming to the Islamic world from China. Now, a popular explanation of how paper arrived in the Islamic world is that during the Battle of the Talas River between the Abbasid Caliphate of Baghdad and the Tang Dynasty of China, the Muslims captured many Chinese soldiers who were kept in the city of Samarkand where they taught the Muslims how to make paper from locally grown hemp. However, the story comes some three centuries after the events it mentions, so scholars doubt its authenticity. Another reason is that Central Asia was already home to a rich tradition of paper making. A ton of paper documents have been discovered, for example in the Xinjiang province of China and neighboring regions. These are written in many languages, including Middle Persian, so it's possible that paper making was already fairly common or at least present in Central Asia before the rise of Islam and it slowly dispersed from there to the Middle East. It was likely merchants and Buddhist monks who took the tradition of papermaking out of China and into the larger world. 
Already by the 10th century, we find references in the Islamic world to the Chinese craft of paper being practiced in Khorasan, the region northeast of Iran. Samarkand, it seems, was the most popular site of paper making and its paper was considered to be of the most superior quality by the 10th century. In any case, we can be confident that after the Battle of the Talas River, Muslims dominated much of Central Asia and from here, the craft of paper making was transmitted to much of the Islamic world. Before the battle, paper was largely unknown in Iran and the lands further west of Iran. Paper may have made its way there from time to time with the Silk Road merchants, but it was never widely produced or even used there. It was only after Talas that paper came to dominate everywhere west of Iran. The city of Baghdad was founded in 762 by the second Abbasid Caliph Al-Mansur as the new capital of the Caliphate. It was to be a great city and the cultural and political heart of the Islamic world. We don't know who established the first papermaking mill in Baghdad. It was either Al-Mansur or his grandson, the famous Harun al-Rashid. It's also possible that the Barmakid family, which served in various high positions in the Abbasid Caliphate, might have introduced it instead. Credence is lent to Harun al-Rashid having introduced papermaking to Baghdad by the fact that the types of papers produced there were known by the names of Harun al-Rashid's governors. For example, Soleimani paper was associated with Harun al-Rashid's financial officer in Khorasan and Jafari paper was associated with Jafar ibn Yahya, Harun al-Rashid's close friend and advisor who was also one of the Barmakids. Either way, by the year 800, the Abbasid bureaucracy had ballooned in size and must have needed a large supply of cheap and easily manufactured material to keep records. As a result, by then paper was being produced and consumed in Baghdad in large quantities. By the 10th century, the great Abbasid capital was home to more than 100 shops selling books and paper. They were selling many types, qualities and sizes of paper. It also had multiple mills, some or all of which were powered by the flowing water of the Tigris River through the usage of water wheels. Baghdad became such an important center of paper making that Byzantine sources sometimes refer to paper by Baghdad's name, Baghdad Ikson. By the year 1000, paper dominated everything in and around the Abbasid Caliphate. Muslims as well as Jews and Christians were using it for all kinds of purposes. Interestingly, early on, Muslims wrote the Qur'an only on parchment, like the Jews with the Torah, but by the year 1000 CE, Muslims began writing the Qur'an on paper as well, but it seems that only the best quality of paper was used for the Qur'an. Part of the reason might have been that scraps of fiber and rags were often used for producing paper and they weren't exactly considered the cleanest material out there. So maybe Muslims and other religious communities were reluctant to write their holy scripture on paper. The earliest piece of paper that can be linked to Baghdad is a letter written by members of the Babylonian Jewish Academy to their colleagues in Fostad, Egypt. It was written in the 9th century and already by then the quality of paper was remarkably good. Paper making only kept improving in the city of Baghdad. Its paper was the widest available in the region and hence considered of the greatest quality. However, unfortunately, the tradition of paper making in Baghdad came to an abrupt end in 1258 when the Mongols sacked the great city. Baghdad was thoroughly destroyed by the Mongols and it never recovered. The center of power in the Islamic world moved away from Baghdad and Iraq in general, with nearby Iran and Syria becoming more important. Around a century after the sack of Baghdad, Al Qalqashendi wrote praise for the quality of Baghdadi paper, but it seems that by then the quantity of paper manufactured in the great city had greatly decreased and hence Baghdadi paper had become much more expensive. It was no longer affordable for common men to write letters on it. Instead, it was reserved for use by princes and for writing the Quran. In the one and a half centuries between 1258 and 1400, Baghdad was still producing paper, but other cities around the Islamic world had taken over much of its former market. 
The Mongol successor Khanid, known as the Ilkhanid, had several mills in Iran and was producing paper for, among other things, everyday uses. It seems that because of the increased connection with China during the reign of the Ilkhanid, new techniques and artisans may have come to Baghdad and the Islamic world in general from China. This improved the quality of paper produced in the Islamic East. However, Baghdad's tenure as the great center of paper making came to an end when the Turco-Mongol conqueror Tamerlane or Temur the Lame destroyed Baghdad in 1401. The city had already been ravaged by the Black Death in the 1340s and 50s. The city not only never recovered, but it also lost whatever importance it still had following the Mongol sack of 1258. Its population was massacred. Baghdad would never again hold the same value as the heart of the Islamic world that it did in its heyday. Harun al-Rashid also established the first papermaking mills in Syria, where Damascus became one of the biggest centers of paper production. Paper was even sometimes known as Carta Damascina in the Latin Western Europe. Syria too produced paper for a number of purposes, including pigeon mail. Warkal tire or bird paper was a huge portion of paper produced there. It was lightweight and small and was hence carried by pigeons around the various empires for communication. Damascus too was sacked by Tamerlane and its artisans were moved to Samarkand. It too never recovered its paper making industry. Together, Damascus and Baghdad produced most of the paper that had been used in Europe by the year 1200. However, their slow decline in the one and a half centuries between 1250 and 1400 led to Europeans, specifically Italians, take much of their former market. Iran, likewise, got paper-making mills in the 9th and 10th centuries. It seems that, along with Muslims, Manichaeans were also producing paper, because we know of at least one monastery of the Manichaeans that was exporting paper throughout the Islamic world. It became a vibrant center of papermaking during the era of the Ilkhanid, when many surviving manuscripts that we have were produced on very high quality paper in Iran. The Ilkhanid also tried to issue paper currency in Iran made through block printing, but their attempt failed. After Tamerlane, Iran too declined in its paper making industry, but was able to bounce back better than ever under Tamerlane's successors as they funded great projects of calligraphy and illustrations. Paper of very high quality in a number of colors was being produced and used in Iran and Central Asia in the 15th and 16th centuries. Around this time, calligraphers began to develop a liking for Chinese paper as well. Chinese paper, known as khitai in Persia, was considered the best for calligraphy and was imported at great costs. Chinese paper, decorated with gold, was even sent as gifts by the Chinese rulers to Persian ones. It was in the 15th century that this Quran was produced in either Iran or Central Asia on Chinese paper. This Quran was sold by Christie's in 2020 for over 7 million pounds. Iranian papermaking kept its remarkable quality all the way till the 17th and 18th centuries when they were displaced by Indian and later Russian paper. Out of all parts of the Islamic world, Iran maintained its tradition for the longest through both thick and thin. By the 10th century, Egypt was producing paper as well. By around the early 1200s, according to a traveler to Egypt, the Egyptians had even forgotten how to produce papyrus, a product that they had been producing for 4,000 years. Archaeological evidence supports it as well, because a batch of 441 documents was found in Egypt in 1980, and from those, only around 7 or 2% were on papyrus. The rest were parchment at 8% and paper at 90%. We actually know a lot about the usage of writing material in medieval Egypt thanks to the Ganiza documents. These are a collection of something like 400,000 documents that were found in the storeroom or Ganiza of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Cairo, Egypt. A small number of the documents are from before the year 1000, but most of them are from between 1000 and 1300 or so. Funny enough, these documents were actually stored for proper disposal. 
Jews believe that documents that have God's name on them must be buried. And that's what would have been the fate of these documents as well. But it seems that for almost three centuries, the store kept growing until its usage declined. However, there were documents dated to around the 18th and 19th centuries as well. The importance of the Geniza documents for research into the lives of Egyptians, and specifically Jewish Egyptians, in the early centuries of the second millennium cannot be exaggerated. They teach us about the languages that were spoken, including a lot about Arabic. They tell us about the Fatimid Caliphate and the subsequent Ayyubid dynasty. They tell us about life around the Mediterranean in general at the time as well. Roughly around 300,000 of these documents are on paper. This huge number of paper documents from the era clearly shows how quickly paper had taken over the writing material industry. Now, Egypt, in case you don't know, has this really massive river going through it called the Nile, which makes it a really good place for agriculture, hence making it possible to grow crops that were used in the production of new paper. Also, industry at the time was powered by moving water, so the Nile, like the Tigris in Baghdad, was a good place to put paper mills. Due to these factors, Egypt became quite a powerhouse when it comes to producing paper. From a story told by the scholar Abdel Latif al-Baghdadi, it seems that the Egyptian grave robbers were selling rags stolen from ancient Egyptian mummies to paper makers. Paper produced by recycling older material was cheaper and was hence available to be used for regular everyday things, including wrapping paper for groceries. However, it took a few centuries for this to be possible. In the 14th century, when Ibn Battuta went to Egypt, it seems that paper was still not fully available to the peasants and was only used by officials of the government and religious institutions. Interesting side note here. Paper made from mummy wrappings was often brown in color, and it's possible that this is the reason that we still use brown paper bags for groceries. You see, there's various stories about this, but the modern brown paper bag comes from the 1850s, when they first started appearing in the United States. The reason that they were brown could be because there were rags from Egyptian mummies being imported to use in paper making. It could also be that ground up mummy remains were used for medicinal purposes and those came in brown paper bags. Maybe the first brown paper bags themselves came from Egypt. We don't know and there's plenty of debate about it, but every time I see a brown paper bag, I'm reminded of the time when people used to eat mummies. Good days. By the way, you can learn more about all that in my video about how Muslims saw ancient Egypt. The Geniza documents show that Egyptian paper was even being traded in India. A Jewish trader from the 11th century was living in India, and he was importing paper to sell there. Along with India, Egyptian paper was being sent to North Africa and Yemen. Despite this, Egypt was still importing paper from Iraq, so it seems that various regions had specializations in various types of paper. After the mid-14th century, Egypt came under the rule of the Mamluks and papermaking reached new heights under them as they commissioned lavish manuscripts of the Quran and other books for themselves. However, at the same time, paper became more expensive. Part of the reason was the plague known as the Black Death. The Black Death hit Egypt particularly hard because of its density around the Nile and resulted in massive depopulation of the country. This meant labor shortages, and as we are seeing in the modern world right now, that means things get more expensive. Hence, linens and paper made in Egypt became too expensive for most people. By this time, Egypt was deeply connected to the Italian peninsula through trade, and when the Italians saw a demand for cheap paper, they supplied it. Italians were able to do this because first, they had more and hence cheaper labor than Egypt and also because they made some technological advancements in the production of linens. We'll discuss how papermaking began in Christian Europe later, but for now, just know that by the 13th century, paper was being produced in Europe in considerable numbers. Anyhow, scrap linens were widely used to make paper, and so if linens were cheap, so was paper. 
since Egypt was itself importing paper now, it couldn't export to North Africa, which the Italians also provided paper to. However, by that point, North Africa wasn't actually using a ton of paper, and the people there still had a preference for parchment. While Italians provided paper to the Egyptians, they got an interesting thing in return. Playing cards. Playing cards were likely invented in China as well, and became a popular pastime throughout the Islamic world. There's a 15th century pack of hand-painted cards sitting in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul, which is pretty much the same as the modern playing cards, with 52 cards in four sets. Swords, polo sticks, cups, and coins. The king does exist as Malik, but the queen and the jack are instead Naib Malik or deputy king and Thani Naib or second deputy. Obviously, there's no queen. It is from the word Naib, meaning deputy, that the Spanish term for playing card, Naipes, comes from. By the 1450s, only a century after the Black Death, the Italians dominated paper production around the Mediterranean Sea and used it to purchase spice from the Egyptian markets. Over the next centuries, other European countries entered the paper market as well. Paper market and intellectual life in general faded away from Egypt when the Ottomans took over in the 16th century. In the 17th century, a traveler writes that there were only 20 bookshops in all of Cairo. Egypt's paper market never recovered. North Africa, west of Egypt, didn't use paper until around a century after it was already popular in Egypt. However, paper did become popular in Muslim Spain, where it was provided by the city of Fez in Morocco, which, according to one probably highly exaggerated report, had 472 paper mills by the year 1300. However, by the year 1409, it seems that European paper was dominant there as well. There was a fatwa declared that year, 1409, which dealt with whether or not it was permissible to use European paper. The problem was that this paper sometimes was watermarked with images of the cross or other living beings, and using it for religious purposes was forbidden. However, this fatwa declared that by writing Allah's name on the paper made by Christians, one was replacing, quote, falsehood with the truth. And so it was okay to use this paper. Paper likely made its way to Muslim Spain in the 10th century. And by the year 1056, we get our first mention of a paper mill in Spain, in the city of Yativa. The city actually became known for the quality of its paper throughout the Islamic world. By 1100, there were mentions of paper mills in Toledo and Seville. Spanish paper is mentioned as being white, strong, and smooth, making it easier to copy books onto them. However, post the 1150s, the Muslims began to be pushed out of Spain and into North Africa. Ultimately, Muslim political presence on the Iberian Peninsula was brought to an end in 1492. At this point, every Arabic manuscript that the Christian kingdoms could get their hands on was burnt during the famous Spanish Inquisition, which is why, unfortunately, we know so little about papermaking in Muslim Spain. What little we know, we know from books carried by Muslims fleeing Spain. We also know a bit from paper made by Christians in Spain after the Muslims left because we can assume that some of these techniques were taught to the Christian papermakers by the Muslims. Now, the ubiquity of paper in the Islamic world was in no small part thanks to the Muslim veneration of the written word. While the first revelation of the Quran began with the word Iqra or recite, it also featured the mention of a pen. While the word Qur'an means recitation, the text of the Qur'an calls itself Kitab multiple times. Kitab means book or simply writing. There are many stories from the Islamic tradition that tell us that Prophet Muhammad, while not literate himself, wanted his community to be literate and made arrangements for children in the community to be taught reading and writing. Hence, later Muslims saw in the written word not only knowledge and wisdom, but also beauty. 
Since Islam prohibits making images of living beings, Islamic buildings couldn't be decorated with images of angels and prophets like those in Christian Europe. However, they still had to be decorated if the Muslims were to stand on the same ground as the great Romans and Persians before them. So Muslims went with writing, particularly calligraphy. To this day, all kinds of buildings in the Islamic world are decorated with calligraphy from mosques to parliaments and even eternal symbols of love. When the earliest of the companions of the Prophet began to die out in the 630s, 40s and 50s, there was a danger of the Quran being lost and hence the Muslims decided to turn it into a book form and write it down in its entirety. However, this wasn't how it was meant to be read, even at that time. Rather, it was just a tool to help memorize the Quran. Most people learn the Quran verbally from a teacher who might use a written Quran to make corrections, but the memory was the primary storage medium for the Quran. However, writing was used in another way to help memorize. Students often had to recite the Quran, learn it by heart, and then write it down on tablets to help the process. This meant that you couldn't learn the Quran without learning to write, and most students who were educated were educated in the Quran first and foremost from a young age and then educated in the more secular disciplines. Not only Muslims, but Christians and Jews were also reading and writing Arabic. You see, the Umayyad Caliphate had made Arabic the official language of their government. So all their officials between what is now Pakistan and what is now Spain were writing in Arabic, despite their different backgrounds, cultures, and yes, religions. So this wide empire shared a common language that was the language of administration and other legal purposes. Not only that, Arabic also became the language of culture, displacing both Persian and Greek in the lands under Umayyad control. So writing and specifically writing Arabic was ingrained as an important part of the Islamic society. This was a society that was ripe for something like paper to change. By the year 1000, writing had become more common than just for religious and administrative purposes. There were two shifts around this time that made writing more accessible. First, the arrival of paper and second, the invention of a new, less formal script for the Arabic language. You see, earlier manuscripts of the Quran, in general, look like this, with these decorative long strokes. It's known as the Kufic script, and if you were to use this for everyday writing, it would be quite tedious and time-taking. So slowly, a more casual version of the Arabic script was introduced, which was more cursive and closer to the Arabic script we know and love today. Interestingly, even though it was meant for everyday use, even the Quran began to be written in this script. The first Quran that we have that is written on paper is also the first Quran that uses the cursive script. This script would get even curvier over the next centuries and lead to the script that we today know as Naskh. This cursive script made it easier for everyone to write, and so even the Christians who wrote Arabic used it for the Gospels. Funny enough, the first copy of the Gospels that actually uses the script is more than 50 years older than the first Quran in this script. The copy of the Gospels is dated to 897, while the copy of the Quran comes around 950 or so. Both of these changes led to what can only be described as an explosion in book writing. Before this, the most common books were the Quran and books on religious, legal, and scientific matters. Most of these were commissioned by rich patrons, caliphs, bureaucrats, governors, etc. But now, books on a variety of subject matters were being written to be sold to common folk. We get our first books of poetry and stories and history and cultures and even cookbooks. Cookbooks show us a particularly interesting feature of the Islamic world. Since everyone had access to Arabic from Spain to Pakistan, they could learn from each other's recipes. For example, one writer mentions his love for Yemeni food while he himself lived in Iraq. Similarly, other books were also sold in different places and the demand for books was quite high because more and more people could read Arabic. The translation movement also played a role. 
Rich Muslim patrons paid translators to translate books from languages such as Persian, Syriac, and Greek into Arabic. There are even stories about the translators being paid the book's weight in gold. While that's likely an exaggeration, it was definitely a lucrative business to be an author, a scribe, or a translator. It paid well and it earned you the respect of your peers. People do a lot worse to earn money and respect these days. I guess it says something when a society pays its scholars well. While books were relatively common and affordable, only the rich could afford to build huge libraries, but the generous among them allowed access to those who wanted to read them. The early Abbasid caliphs similarly had huge collections that were kept in public libraries, especially those associated with the House of Wisdom. Additionally, the book markets in Baghdad also served something like libraries, where scholars would pay shops to rent out books. The great polymath al Jahiz seems to have rented out entire shops by the day. Honestly, the book reading culture of the time demands a video of its own. For now, just know that paper made reading books cheaper and played no small part in the so-called golden age of Islam. Paper was universally present and adored in the Islamic world, and it was from here that Europeans got it. Speaking of which, let's now talk about how papermaking arrived in Europe. Before the year 1000, paper production was on the rise in the Islamic world. It's only after 1000 that papermaking was transmitted from the Islamic world into Christian Europe. As you would expect, the parts of Europe closest to Islamic lands geographically were the first to start using and producing paper. In the East, the earliest paper document found linked to the Byzantine Empire is dated to 1052. The paper is very similar to the paper used by the Muslim Fatimid dynasty in Egypt. Over the next century, paper was used more and more for legal documents, but it seems that parchment was still preferred by the Byzantines because they saw parchment as more durable and kept parchment copies of documents and books to be preserved while paper copies were often sent out. Before the year 1200, paper was imported by the Byzantines from the Islamic lands, which is why, as I mentioned before, some types of paper came to be associated with the name of the city of Baghdad. After 1200, European paper took over the Byzantine market, especially Italian paper. There's no evidence that Byzantine Constantinople ever housed a paper mill as the capitals in the Islamic world did, however. To the west, Muslims controlled a large part of the Iberian Peninsula when the year 1000 rolled around. Paper was being used by not only Muslims but also Christians and Jews in Spain by this point. In fact, the abbot of Cluny, Peter the Venerable, visited northern Spain and wrote about how the Jews wrote the Talmud on paper. He is disgusted by the fact that paper is made from scraps of old rags and is hence not fit to write a holy book on. As Muslim territory was rolled back by the Christian kingdoms, cities like Yativa, Toledo, and Seville came under Christian control and Christians took over the papermaking industry. Christian Spain became quite a powerhouse in papermaking and Spanish paper became famous throughout the Mediterranean world. However, by the mid 14th century, right around the time of the Black Death, Italian paper had taken over and the Spanish paper industry had declined. The legacy of both Muslim and Christian Spain's papermaking industry is that the word ream, often used as a unit of quantity for paper, comes from the Spanish term resma, which comes from the Arabic rizma, meaning bundle. Uh, I learned that a ream of paper is 300 sheets. I thought it was 500. Oh. Okay, now to the big dog, Italy. Throughout the video, I've talked about how Italy became the dominant player in the Mediterranean paper-making industry, but how did they do that? Well, let's go back to the 9th century. In 827 CE, the Muslim Aghlabid dynasty from what is now Tunisia invaded Sicily and started conquering it. Over the next 80 years, it kept expanding its control into Sicily and parts of southern Italy. After the dissolution of the Aghlabid dynasty, the Shia Fatimid dynasty inherited Sicily. Due to all this Islamic influence, Sicily actually became a Christian part of the Islamic world, not unlike Muslim Spain. However, 
Towards the end of the 11th century, Christians started to reconquer Sicily and pushed the Muslims out under the reign of King Roger I. But Islamic influence did not die out anytime soon. In 1109, Queen Adelaide, the widow of King Roger I, issued an order on a paper document. That's the earliest piece of paper we have from Sicily. However, we do know of some documents written on paper some 20 years earlier that haven't survived. That is not very late. It pretty much lines up with the rest of the Islamic West, particularly Northwestern Africa and Spain. By the 1150s, paper had spread to the rest of Italy. The rise of paper and then paper making in Italy coincided with the rise of notaries there. The origins of the notary can be traced back to the ancient Roman Republic, but their use had declined after the collapse of the Roman Empire. However, after the 12th century, notaries became more commonplace in Italy, and paper was the perfect material for them to create legal documents. While paper was obviously less durable than parchment, it was still pretty durable, and it was cheaper than parchment and easier to store, so it was good enough for these legal documents, such as oaths, wills, commercial, financial, and marriage contracts. Any documents that needed to be more durable were simply copied onto parchment and kept as a record. Genoa, in northern Italy, was perhaps the first place to extensively use paper for legal documents, at least in Italy. They were in contact with the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire, as mentioned before, was using paper for its legal documents, so perhaps it had an impact on Genoa starting to use paper. The first paper mill in northern Italy was also founded near Genoa, where we have a legal contract from 1235 that mentions a paper maker. Soon, paper mills started popping up all over Italy. The most famous of these new paper making places was Fabriano, which is still known for its paper. It's possible that Fabriano's paper making techniques actually came directly from the Islamic world because the earliest paper made there is quite similar to that of the Muslim world at that time. Perhaps the connection between Europe and the Islamic world, formed during the Crusades, helped as well. Soon Fabriano paper took over not only Italy but the rest of the Mediterranean world as well and ended up competing in markets such as Spain and Egypt against locally made paper. They were able to make paper cheaper due to their abundance of rugged terrain and plentiful rivers. The rugged terrain meant that there were more streams and the rivers could be faster, hence more energy could be drawn from them. On top of that, the Italians used their technological knowledge to improve upon the techniques learned from the East. In addition to that, they were very good merchants and knew how to dominate a market. There's actually evidence to suggest that they straight up pulled an Amazon and sold their paper cheaper in Egypt at first and killed their local competition. From 1300 onwards, we start seeing more and more European paper in the Islamic world. Before we leave Italy, let me talk briefly about their advancements in paper making. First, they started using watermarks to identify their paper, which is why we know so much about Italian paper, because we usually know when and where a particular piece of paper was made. Second, they started using gelatin instead of wheat or rice, which were common in the Islamic world. Okay, again, without being too technical, I'll explain that paper needs something to stop it from absorbing too much ink. In the Islamic world, this was done with starch, particularly wheat or rice. Both of these starches grow mold and are hence not very good for moist climates. The Italians started using gelatin extracted from animals, including pigs, which is why Muslims were so reluctant to use their paper. Anyhow, this made the paper stronger and easier to produce. They also mechanized the process of pulping which, as the name suggests, is the process of breaking down whatever plant you're using into pulps or fiber of cellulose. The earliest piece of paper found in Germany dates to around 1246 from the city of Passau. As you'd expect, it's Italian paper. However, in 1390, Germany got its first paper mill in the town of Greichmüller near Nuremberg. The mill, seen here, was run by Italians. Other mills popped up in Germany soon after, including one in the city of Chemnitz. Now, I mention Chemnitz because their basketball team, the Niners Chemnitz, has as their mascot 
Karl Marx. That is my absolute favorite fact in the entire universe. The city was actually called Karl Marx Stadt back in the day when East Germany existed. Thankfully, East Germany doesn't exist anymore. They just built a, an American style parking lot all over that area. Paper spread slower to the rest of Europe than it had in the Islamic world. Some parts of Europe were obviously slower to adapt paper than others, particularly the areas with a ton of cows and sheep because their hide was usually used to make parchment and so parchment was relatively available and cheap in these regions. By the 15th century, paper didn't yet rule the European landscape the way that it did the Islamic one, but that was about to change. A revolution was about to come up from Germany. Well, actually, two revolutions. The first was, of course, the invention, or rather reinvention, of the movable type printing press by Johannes Gutenberg around 1440. The second was the Protestant Reformation. Now, the printing press played a major role in the Protestant Reformation. It made the storage and transmission of information much easier and cheaper than it had been before, at least in Europe. At the time that the printing press came around, the fate of paper in much of Europe was still up in the air. It wasn't as common as it was in other places in Europe, such as Italy or much of the Islamic world. The printing press needed a cheaper material to print on and paper turned out to be that material. It's possible that without paper, the printing press would have failed. And without the printing press, at least in Europe, paper would have failed. Bringing these two together opened the door to a new world, where knowledge was much more accessible and open to the public, allowing the masses to educate themselves and re-evaluate their societies and maybe build a better one with things like human rights and democracy and the Big Mac. The story of paper doesn't simply end here. Europeans kept improving on papermaking techniques and disseminating these techniques to the rest of the world. Like pretty much all mechanical processes, the Industrial Revolution contributed to further advances in making paper better and cheaper until today when we're at a point where a grocery store you shopped at eight years ago can send you a whole magazine of coupons that you immediately throw away in the garbage. Seriously, why hasn't junk mail been banned yet? 90% of it is thrown away immediately. How is it legal to print so much stuff and just throw it in the mailboxes of unconsenting people? It's, it's truly baffling. The story of paper is also the story of human collaboration in a way. It was invented in China and probably merchants and monks took it to the Middle East, from where, again, merchants took it to Europe, from where it was taken to the New World, not really by merchants though. On every step along that way, people made improvements to it. Over the 2000 years of its rise to world domination, paper has seen the inside of mosques, and synagogues, and monasteries, temples, royal courts, battlefields, and even bathrooms. There's perhaps no product that has been as universal over the past 500 years as paper has been. And I think it's really beautiful that all these civilizations and cultures contributed to it in their own ways. Paper is a monument to human ingenuity and everyone has contributed a brick or two to its construction. See you next time. Don't forget to subscribe and press the bell icon. On the screen right now, you can see the names and tiers of the patrons. You can join them by pledging a dollar or more to support the channel. Thank you for watching.